gentlemen, put your hands together for Doug Howe. Doug. Good evening. I'm so happy to be here. So uh, it started innocently enough. My mom was turning 80. She had just survived a horrible car crash that put her in the hospital for four weeks. She had a fractured skull, a broken shoulder, punctured eardrums, and extensive contusions. Seems that she had run a flashing red light out at the outskirts of this small town in northern New York where I'm from. And she got hit by a tractor trailer. Yeah, really. When we saw her car and the condition of that car, we said to ourselves, there's no way in hell she's going to survive this. She was in the hospital for four weeks and she survived, she did. Said something about my mom. Yeah, oh yeah. My mom didn't have much parenting skills. Neither of my parents did. There was way too much alcohol involved. And I come from a pretty dysfunctional family, lots of arguments and disagreements, and we never took much of our parents' advice. But my mom did teach us how to survive. I remember one time when I was going through a rough period in my life, I was talking with my mom and she said, Doug, you know, if you have family, you can survive anything. And as difficult as my mom was to live with, she did believe in family. When she got out of the hospital, it was about two months later would be her birthday which was on November 21st, just four days from now. We decided that we would give her something nice. We'd take her out to a nice place for dinner. And my most favorite, and my one and only sister, uh, she was to make the reservation at some place, which she did at a snazzy little place called the 1850 House in Oswego, a town about 10 miles down the road. And she called me up and she said, Doug, the place is a little expensive. But it is fancy, and you know mom likes fancy when she can get it. <laughs> she just didn't get it very often. <laughs> now I was a little surprised on two fronts. Number one, Sarah is just the exact opposite of my mom, as frugal as the day is long, and she found a, an expensive restaurant. And secondly, that there would be such a place in Oswego, right. just 10 miles away in way upstate New York. Now this is snow country. We get. 200 inches of snow or more a year on a regular basis. This is four-wheel drive and ski-doo country. And not a place for luxury hotels or five-star restaurants, but hey, what the heck did I know? I hadn't been living there in 30 years. So mom's recovering two months later. It's the end of November. My wife and I fly in from Detroit and we stay at my sister's house with her, my brother-in-law. And the night of the dinner birthday party. We kind of get dressed up a little bit. My brother-in-law says he'll be the designated driver. He'd take us up to Swigo. We all pile in the car and we're going up. And we find the 1850 house real easy. There's great big numbers over the cross. Top of the door, 1850, can't miss it. And it was a real cold night. And there was a parking spot right in front of the front door of the restaurant. Pretty amazing, <laughs> but it should have been my first clue <laughs> that something was amiss. <laughs> so we get out of the car and we approach the building and the front door has got a great big piece of plywood on it, like the window was broken or something. And uh, there's a picture window on each side of the door and you can't see any light coming from the inside of the building hardly. But we can see just inside of these picture windows that there's antiques, all kinds of uh, glasses and silverware and pictures and watches. So we push on the door and it swings open. And as we walk inside, we're walking in kind of an aisleway along rows of glass-lined cases full of antiques. Costume jewelry, watches, clocks, paintings, cups, saucers, bowls, all kinds of things and old clothes, lots of old clothes, all piled in a random fashion. And I say to my sister, 
Sarah, is this place open? <laughs> and she looks at me and she, she's got her eyes are wide like this. She said, Doug, I don't even know if we're in the right place. <laughs> and just then we hear a voice farther in the building. He says, come on in, come on in. We've been expecting you. And we look up and there's this gentleman, kind of a middle-aged, handsome guy, about 50 feet up and a landing, about three steps up on a landing. And he's motioned to us, come on in. And he, and as we approach, he starts singing, Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. And he knew my mom's name from my sister making the reservation. And as we got up there, he took my mom's hand and he finished the song and gives her a big old kiss on the cheek. And my mom said, this place is beautiful. <laughs> and he introduced himself as Joe, the owner. And then he introduces an older woman who, her, her name was Marge, that was beside him. And Marge had a dowager's hump and walked with a, a limp. She had a huge mole on her chin. <laughs> but Marge was wearing a blonde wig that looked like it was on sideways or, or, or backwards or something. It was like you, you, you kind of look at her and say, something's not right there, honey. You know, but of course you don't say that, you know. So Marge then introduces her husband, who's sitting behind them a little bit to the left at a little tiny table. I can't remember his name now, but she said he's a spry 90 years young. Isn't that wonderful? Well, Joe says, you know, uh, we've been closed for the past two weeks because of a burglary, but we opened up just for you because we heard it was your birthday, and please have a seat at the table in front of the fireplace. So we go over to the fireplace and sit at the table, but it wasn't just a table. It looked like there was a rectangular table and a round table, both pushed together, covered by a dark cloth. Now uh, there was place settings for everyone, a plate and a bowl, uh, a napkin and a wine glass. But as I sat down, I noticed that not every place had silverware. I never wanted to keep my mouth shut, so I said, hey, there's not silverware at everyone. Mark says, huh, looks like you're gonna have to share because we well, you know, might not have enough. <laughs> and without batting an eye, she turns to my mom and says, so you're 80, hey, doll? Well, guess what, so am I. Got any stories? And before my mom could open her mouth, she says, never mind, I got a million of them. And with that, she takes a chair and pulls it up next to my mom as close as she can get it, puts her arm around her, and starts telling stories. Well, not stories exactly, jokes. Raunchy jokes. <laughs> now, I'm a Marine. I've heard a lot of launch, raunchy jokes, right? These were raunchy jokes. <laughs> and my sister, Sarah, has got her mouth down on the table, and she's looking to Marge and then back to her husband, like in disbelief. My brother Philip is kind of giggling nervously. And I look over at mom and she is just shrieking with delight. <laughs> she, she is being entertained for sure. But Marge was a terrible joke teller. In the middle at so, or some part of every single joke, she had to turn to her husband and say, what's the next line? <laughs> or what's the punchline? While she was telling these jokes, she said to us, if you want something from the bar, you get up and get it yourself because I don't feel like getting up. <laughs> and then she said, and bring some bottles of wine down, see if they're any good. Oh, and by the way, we don't have any corkscrews here. So Gene says, I got a corkscrew out in the car. He goes and get a corkscrew and I open the first bottle and it is pure vinegar. <laughs> and then, but we managed to find a few bottles that were passable, right? So, uh, as Marge was telling these jokes, I get a better look at the room. My pupils are dilating now at the, far enough that I can see something that's, see some of the room. And I noticed that the table is in front of the fireplace about three feet, but there's no fire in the fireplace. And there's a really strong smell of propane in the room. But the draft at our ankles is so strong and cold and I'm not worried about the propane. It's, it's being taken out really quickly. <laughs> and there's a ceiling fan over the table 
it's only got one blade. Uh, it's, it's true. And around the room, there's a bunch of clocks, mostly grandfather-type clocks. Some of them are on the wall with all of them had pendulums, but they, and they're all working, but they're all told different times. One said two o'clock, one said quarter to three, one said 11.30. So I'm saying to myself, am I caught in a time warp? You know? And I'm getting nervous. I'm looking over to Sarah and I'm going, and she's looking back at me, she's going, yeah, like this. Well, about then, Joe comes out from around what I thought was the kitchen, behind where the fireplace was, and he asked us all if we, like, if we all like chicken and veal and lamb. We all did, and I'm saying to myself, okay, maybe things will start looking up here, you know? Without giving us menus or asking us which of those things we'd like, one minute later he comes out with the first course, Italian sausage with greens. <laughs> now it's dark in there. But I could see that shit. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't tell what kind of greens they were, but they were, they were bad, man. One bite of that sausage, and I said, oh shit, that's wrong. <laughs> and I'm looking around, and I'm looking at the rest of the family, and they're all eating, and mom is, ooh, ah. It's like she's dining with the queen, you know? So I'm saying to myself, you know what, Doug, bite your tongue. You're here for mom. Don't make a scene. It might take a lot of that damn cheap wine to go down tonight, but you're gonna do it for mom. And every successive course was more of the same. Wilted lettuce with a oil and vinegar and no spices and way too much oil that tasted like corn oil. And the next course was Lipton's chicken and star soup. And I swear to God, that's the truth. There is nobody else that makes those little stars. That's what that soup was, I'm telling you. After that was a little tiny meatball on white beans with a tinny tasting red sauce. And then after that, shrimp tortellini in a butter sauce <laughs> that tasted like margarine. And the tortellini was so overcooked, I couldn't eat it with a fork. Because every time I touched it, it would disintegrate. So I had, to eat, I had to eat it with a spoon. Now, Joe was the only guy who came in and out of the kitchen. He'd served us and cleared the plates and everything. And while he was doing this, a gentleman walked in the buildings, came in, sat at the bar, took his coat off like he belonged there. Joe, Joe came over to us and he said, you know what, I think I forgot to lock the door, I'm sorry. But the guy sat at the bar, and every time, in between Joe serving us and clearing us dishes, he would go over there and talk like they were best friends. And that guy ate the same dishes that we ate. And when he got up to leave, I didn't see any money changing hands. I think we paid for his meal. <laughs> well, after he cleared the dishes from the tortellini and shrimp, uh, he came out and he said, well, you know what? I think we probably have had enough to eat tonight and there wouldn't be any chicken and veal and lamb. And I think there was some general agreement that uh, maybe we had had enough. And for me, I think there was some general relief that we had had enough. And then he brings out this little cake for the whole table and had store-bought written all over it. And he sets the cake in front of my mom and and he starts singing the happy birthday song again. And he sings the song and we're all eating the coat cake and he goes down in front and he gets this brooch. It's a little costume jewelry brooch and he comes over and he pins it on my mom. And I thought my mom was gonna swoon with delight. She is having the time of her life. We eat the cake and mom says, you know what, I wanna go down and look at the antiques down there. So we all get up and we get down and we're looking at the antiques and we notice that there's a big doorway on the left that goes into another part of the building that's the mirror image of the side that we were on. And in the front part towards the street, there's a number of tables and chairs like a restaurant dining room with light white linens and, and everything. And I'm saying, what the hell, man, why come, what's, what, you know, how come not us? And around, the, and around the edge, uh, there's more antiques everywhere, pictures and old clothes and everything all around. So we're looking at that, and all of a sudden, there's Joe in in, amongst us, and he grabs Mom by the elbow, 
and he takes her over to a great big piano, and on top of the piano is a bunch of song books, and he says, what kind of songs do you want to hear, honey? And my mom's got something of a voice herself, and loved music, and she says, I want to hear oldies, I want to hear Peggy Lee, and I'm Perry Como and Frank Sinatra. So they start singing, and the rest of us are looking at the antiques in the room, and my wife finds a five-inch painted plate with a little fawn in a forest setting, a little idyllic scene. She goes over to Marge and she says, she says how, how much is this plate? And Marge says, I think that's probably about $15. And uh, so my wife takes the plate over to my sister to say, we want to give this to Gene for being the designated driver tonight. Do you think he would like that? And my sister says she thought that would be just fine. And not knowing that my wife had gone to Marge to re ask about the price, my sister takes it to Marge to ask about the price, and Marge says, I think that's about $20. <laughs> so later on in the evening, we decided we're going to buy this plate. And of course, all transactions have to go through Joe, the chef, entertainer, cook, <laughs> chef all-around big guy, and he says, oh, I think that's about $30. <laughs> My brother-in-law still has that plate, proudly displayed on his kitchen wall, because we did buy it for him. And as they were perusing the, the an antiques, I went farther back in the building where, across from where this fireplace and, and table was that we, we ate from, there was no light back there, except the light coming from the other side of the kitchen. And out of the kitchen, you could see this blue smoky haze coming out. And I said to myself, don't go back there, Doug. Don't, don't, just don't, don't. You got the food in your belly. You want to keep it there. Do not go back there. Don't look in that kitchen. But around that room were boxes and boxes and boxes of old clothes, unfolded heaps of clothes. And right in the middle of the room was an ironing board with a single iron on it. And on top of the ironing board was a pile of old clothes. And this is strange, but I say, well, there's nothing here. So I start to come back down. I go by the piano. And my mom is singing, you give me a fever <laughs> when you kiss me. And she is having a riot. So we go back down and we're looking at the antiques. And after about a while, we say, you know, it's about time to go. And I, I say, Joe, we need, I need to uh, get up with you and, about the bill and pay you. And so Joe and I go around the, the other side to the bar and Joe's tabulating things up. And he says, you know, I'm doing some calculations here that's going to make it easy on you. <laughs> you know, that's always a warning. <laughs> right. So he hands me a bill that's just shy of $400. I know, right? So I'm, it takes me about five seconds. And in that five seconds, there's 8,000 things in my brain that I'm saying to him. And I say, you know what? I'm not going to make a scene. This is for mom. We're going to do this for her because we owe it to her. We're going to make a good night for her. So I paid the bill, and to this day, I would like to go back there and have a conversation with Joe. <laughs> but we got our coat on, and uh, Joe comes over and helps Mom put her coat on. He's fawning all over her, and she's just loving every minute of it. And we go to the door, and we notice the door is still not locked. And we go outside into the very cold November air and get into Gene's car. Now, normally our family is talkative family, we can't stop talking. We're talking all over each other and yelling at each other. Shut up, I'm talking. No, it's I'm talking. It's your f but there's nobody saying anything. As we begin to drive out of town, each one of us thinking that on that last street corner before we hit the country road, we're gonna see Rod Serling standing there, <laughs> smiling at us. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Nobody's talking, that is, except my mother, who's singing, Moon River, wider than a mile. Mom had had the time of her life, and that's what we wanted. A year and a half later, my mother died of breast cancer. This is going to be tough for me. She had her family by her side.
and for all the years that I gave her so much grief and all of us. She taught me. If you've got family, you can survive anything. And at her death, she had her family with her. And we all knew that she was the soul of that family. Thank you so much for listening to my story.